This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 8. Sexuality The immediate, natural, and necessary relation of human being to human being is also the relation of male to female. In this natural species relationship, man's relation to nature is directly his relation to man, and his relation to man is directly his relation to nature, to his own natural function. Thus, in this relation is sensuously revealed, reduced to an observable fact, the extent to which human nature has become nature for man, and to which nature has become human nature for him. From this relationship man's whole level of development can be assessed. It follows from the character of this relationship how far man has become, and has understood himself, as a species being, a human being. The relation of man to woman is the most natural relation of human being to human being. It indicates, therefore, how far man's natural behavior has become human, and how far his human essence has become a natural essence for him, how far his human nature has become nature for him. It also shows how far man's needs have become human needs, and consequently, how far the other person, as a person, has become one of his needs and to what extent he is, in his individual existence, at the same time, a social being. 89. Orgastically potent sexual experience is the very archetype of the resonance of egoisms, the immediate unity of pleasure-getting and pleasure-giving. 90. I don't just want a fuller sex life. I want my whole life to be a sex life. 91. The sociality of man reveals itself nowhere more strongly than in sexual sociability and sexual solidarity. The sexual need, more profoundly and more immediately than any other, reveals the fallacy of narrow egoism. The need to touch another person, another's body, to be physically close, to caress and be caressed. Perhaps it is out of the desire, congruent with narrow egoism, to deny the intersubjectivity of this most profoundly intersubjective of needs, that so many perversions begin in order to objectify the subject who is the aim of this need. But here also is a threshold, and an attractor where the expansion of egoism can stop, can get hung up for epics. A collective egoism that never grows bigger than the couple, the collective of two, the isolated duo, the nuclear family. We have here the ideology which holds that the egoistic project could become adequate to itself if only it included two egos. This is but another form of the ideology of anti-socialism, the ideology that seeks to deny the social ingredient in the individual, the self, the personal world, and ends up by denying and depleting the self as well, ends up with an emptied self. According to this ideology, only the personal, intimate, family world the private world of the home is real. The strange, crazy, cold, outside world, the social world, is held to be unreal, though it must be related to, if only to support this narrow, real world. This ideology knows society only as an invasion of privacy. This is the, this is the ideology that will keep the personal world narrow and impoverished, and the social world menacing and alien. Will we get beyond it? Do we want to? Need to? Only time will tell. Capitalist anti-socialism is now rapidly reaching its logical conclusion, the destruction of society. Over this question, all our lives are at stake. 92. Freud even bases his case for instinctual repression on the postulate of such an internal condition as described above, with the help of a few of his typical reified false antitheses. The conflict between civilization and sexuality is caused by the circumstance that sexual love is a relationship between two people in which a third can only be superfluous or disturbing, whereas civilization is founded on relations between larger groups of persons. When a love relationship is at its height, no room is left for any interest in the surrounding world. The pair of lovers are sufficient unto themselves, do not even need the child they have in common to make them happy. Like most calls for moral enforcement, it assumes, unbeknownst to its author, 
who characteristically believes, on the contrary, that people already want too much and are already too selfish, that human greed will not expand beyond a certain narrow domain. 93. The early women's movement was one of the few loci of the nearly self-conscious emergence of radical subjectivity within the new left. The women who created it refused to put off the struggle against their special depression until after the revolution. If human beings have reduced each other to sexual pseudo-objects, have objectified each other sexually, this is by no means the only or the most fundamental way in which they have been objectified. This is only one facet of a general dehumanization and desubjectification. The overcoming of this specific objectification, of the problem posed most subjectively by the early women's liberation movement, and named sexism by the partisans of that movement, can only be of the form of sexual subjectivity as opposed to this sexual objectivity, and expanded sexual egoism as opposed to sexual duty, sexual self-sacrifice, and sexual exploitation. This solution is opposed identically to the various directions taken by the later ideological expropriators of the women's movement, namely that of the abstract negation of sexism, counter-sexism, anti-masculinism, reverse exploitation through the ideological manipulation of male guilt, sexual abstinence, or moralistic lesbianism. Lately, more and more women have felt called on to act in a new role, that of sister. The joy of the initial abstract unity has been replaced by the threat of exclusion for unsisterly behavior. Oppression takes a new form, women over women. It's not the moments of genuine warmth and intimacy, of authentic community within the women's movement that we want to criticize, but precisely the ideology that ultimately poisoned these. The community founded on gender is still an abstract community, still a false community, still the domination over the individual and her desires through the use of abstract categories and external qualities by the ideological representatives of these. The pseudo-community of sisters, assumed and moralistically enforced, is still a community founded on oppression, the repression of radical subjectivity, the representation and enforcement of an abstract determination defining a group of people, in this case, gender, over against their concrete particularity and their conscious self-determination. Bosses come in all genders, no less than in all colors. How much humiliation will it take to learn that a boss having similar skin color or the same type of sexual glands objectifies one no less than any other? Next time a feminist bureaucrat addresses you as sister, listen to the tone of her voice. Why is she whining? Do her words fall like a threat or like a chain? What is it she wants from you? Does she want a subject or a slave? A sex, i.e. a walking abstraction or a person? This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.